hello friends and welcome to another episode of just another kill team podcast uh today we have me jason you can find me on discord jfay we also have travis happy raccoon travis and our illustrious guest kill team stream hello do you want to go by kill team stream or do you want to uh sure i mean my my official name is is sheldon like on on uh all the government documents, but yeah, you can call me Kill Team Stream. Either way is fine. That's the how a lot of the people in the hobby know me. Yeah, I mean, Sheldon has been around our scene for a long time, helping to start the first Kill Team Open along with uh, local organizing in the Bay Area, right? Yep, yep. I've uh, been doing stuff with this game since uh, the, the 2018 version first came out, pretty much, at this point. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of crazy that I started playing in 2018 with the older edition. I actually, I never went to any of the Bay Area tournaments, so I just fully missed you. Yeah, I was looking at that uh, Bay Area Discord, um, and I was like, wait, Travis is on here? <laughs> yeah, I'm like on there as like an admin, because I just like, spun it up, and then we just like never used it, because there weren't enough of us. And it was so hard to find people back in the day for that game. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's I mean, we'll probably talk about it a little bit later, but that's kind of what started everything. <laughs> yeah, me and Jason have got to pick your brain about how you were able to spin stuff up in such a, a different time for the game. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Sheldon, you've been playing Kill Team 2018, Kill Team 2021. I know you have shifted more to kind of like a player role recently. Yep. But what kind of got you started in playing and organizing Kill Team? Because back when this game first started, there really wasn't there really wasn't that much of a scene, obviously, because it was a yeah. brand, brand new game. Yeah, I mean, if we go really far back, uh, it all started. My grandparents took me uh, to England for a while and uh, Games Workshop, you know, is much larger out there. And um, I went into, you know, uh, a Games Workshop store when I was a kid and was infatuated with um, the models, specifically the, the Necrons at the time which uh, used to be like metal uh, blister boxes in the corner of the store and only had rules in a white dwarf. But uh, I I really loved them and so convinced my grandparents to buy me some of them and started a, started a little army and um, was playing as a little kid. And then, um, funny enough, when I went to high school, I started a, a, a games workshop club at my at my high school. And uh, we got a, a few people that that we would like. At the time, Games Workshop had sort of a a store lo- or a I think it was like a school club locator service, and uh, you could kind of like put your club on. And we got a few people from like other schools to show up, including one of my people, one of the people who's still one of my best friends, uh, Zach, came all the way from like the other side of the town and uh, brought his games workshop to our club and uh we played warhammer 40,000 and it was fun and then uh, i kind of got out of it for a long time and i had models just sitting in my my garage for for years and i uh one day was kind of like going through and and pulled out my old games workshop little black briefcase full of models and i was like oh man i remember these guys wonder if this game's still around you know and and like <laughs> Googled it, and at the time, 8th edition had just um, came out, and it was, like, kind of getting big again. Yeah, that and was, I was like, a big oh, wow. push over. That was, yeah. like, a big push for competitive, right? I think it was kind of 7th head. There's, like, the pre-8th and, like, post-8th versions of Kill Team, or Games Workshop games, where it was, like, more casual, more fun, and then it became, like, much more competitive, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, I was I was like, oh wow, this game's still around. These models are worth more than when I was a kid. You know, like they're, it's it's been it's stuck around. Like this is pretty cool. And I was like looking at all the new Necron models that had come out, and I was like, oh, I can actually afford these things. You know, like this is kind of cool. Like I I started picking up like a Necron army, and I was uh, invited my stepbrother to come over and play, and he took like half my Necrons, and I took the other half, and we tried to play a game of 40k, and I was like, oh, this is, uh, t- took like eight hours for us to get to turn two, and I was like, this is a bit much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 
learning no, kill, kind of... learning a uh, 10th edition or learning an actual game of uh, 40k is definitely no easy task yeah and i was like oh maybe this uh maybe this wasn't the best decision and then i think it was like something like a month later they announced kill team 2018 it was that first um like launch trailer uh that was i believe it was like at adepticon and uh they had their reveal trailer and i was like okay maybe this is the game for me this looks pretty sweet you know a little small skirmish version of the game i can still play with my necrons like this sounds pretty fun and so then the game came out and uh it was amazing and i modeled up my like little necron team and uh there was a, a local game store called game castle um that my friend from uh, high school was uh, the manager at and uh, she uh, helped me uh, like sign up for their, their like campaign that they were doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I played it at the time. I was foolish. I thought that in order to play in tournaments, you had to play in a campaign to level up your guys. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Oh, I'm not going to be any good in a tournament with just these like basic level one troops. I got to, you know, get some campaign experience <laughs> that's that how naive, a wild tournament right that's how naive i was back in the day but then uh i really enjoyed the campaign and um had a great time and it was like impossible to find tournaments at the time anywhere like you just couldn't and i was uh using the best coast pairings app i put in kill team and there was just nothing and the only thing i saw on the best coast pairings app at the time was the Las Vegas open uh, kill team tournament. So I was like, Oh, Las Vegas open. And I was like, I told my stepbrother, I'm like, you want to go with me to Vegas? And he's like, sure, let's do it. So we, we uh, uh, drove to Vegas and uh, did the Las Vegas open tournament. And it was so hyped. They like announced the arena expansion oh, and yeah. uh, there was like, yeah, there was like this kind of big kill team hype at the time, and the tournament was really amazing, run uh, by Elliot um, and uh, Alex, uh, aka Kill Team Academy. And um, I remember Kill Team Academy had this little like laptop with like a, a webcam, and he was recording the like streaming the the top table on this like real like the jankiest setup you've ever seen. And as a as like a film and video professional, I was like, well, I mean, if that's like the top like stream, I I like, like you're I you're just in your head, you're like, this is we could definitely do better than that. Yeah. So it all started. I was originally my plan was to like become the streaming guy for Kill Team, and uh, you know, I was like, I you know, I'm a I've got all these cameras and equipment and lights and stuff. I could totally do this, and um. Uh, I went back home and started kind of figuring out how I was going to stream Kill Team, and I realized, well, I need something to stream. You know, I can't just stream if there's no events to stream. So I put a couple, like, tournaments on the Game Castle calendar, and I'll be honest, I uh, I may have uh, overestimated the... Uh, the player the, base? The player base. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I bought like 15 copies of Arena. Oh, <laughs> man. And um, yeah, we had an amazing tournament, by the way. That first tournament was awesome. Like, I don't know if you know too much about like the history of the game, but like Michael T. Holy was there, like uh, uh, Alec uh, Berryman, like a lot of the people that went on to like become, you know, big names in the in the game, like they were at that first little like game castle tournament I ran and uh, <laughs> it was fun. I got to stream the final game and uh, that's kind of where it all started. And then um, shortly after that, Nova open was doing a, uh, their, their tournament and they didn't have enough into the dark sets to be able to run the big tournament. And so I, I actually let them use mine since at the time I had, the world's largest collection of arena sets <laughs> and yeah, um yeah, yeah. yeah just kind of went from there and then i started you know then i was helping out the bay area open uh and then i was uh, running the the socal open and then soon enough the the lvo you know and 
Yeah, you, were, for, you were a force of nature in the first edition, huh? Yeah, and uh, I kind of ran the FAQ for the entire game just based off of, like, necessity because there wasn't really anything from Games Workshop. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it kind of became the, like, standard FAQ for, like, the entire game worldwide. It was kind of it was kind of crazy. Um, and that all just came out of me being lazy. I was like, I didn't want to like have to tell people the same thing over and over and over again. So I was like, I'm just going to write it down, put it on my website, and then I don't have to tell people twice. <laughs> yeah. And it yeah. all came from like a position or go ahead. Yeah. So like where, so you, so you said you had that all on a website. Um, was there like discussions on the website or like a discord server or like, how did you have everyone connected? Uh, well, no, I mean, we just kind of connected through, um, at the time it was the big discord was glass half dead. Um, and so everybody was kind of talking through glass half dead's discord. Uh, and then eventually command point came out and that was, uh, another point of, of discussion online. But my website at the time was literally just, you know, the FAQ, um, you know, some links to uh, the tournaments I was running and then um, some, uh, uh, you know, every time every time a, a tournament would have like a tournament packet, I would just kind of like save it. And then I would have I kind of created like a, a backlog, like history of all the of all the tournament packets. And for a while, it was just like sort of the main like Kill Team website. Like if you searched up Kill Team tournament on Google for a long time, it was like the number one result because i was just the only one putting all that information in one place damn that is that is pretty crazy well, yeah like the the game has grown so much in that in that same time span basically right yeah it's 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 definitely uh leaps and bounds from where it was when i <laughs> when i started yeah definitely more of a it sounds like kind of a one-man show back in the day yeah i mean um Alex, how big was how big was that first tournament that you ran uh it was eight people yeah that's a solid how start. much how much was the yeah. second tournament did it get like bigger over time because I, uh, I don't actually remember how big because i wasn't really into competitive kill team back in the day i was just like playing with some friends at work so i actually have no idea how big the scene actually got locally well so that that las vegas open tournament was uh pretty big i want to say it was like maybe 24 people um, and then, yeah, the tournament that I ran after that was eight, but then the following tournament, um, that I ran actually the only person who showed up, it was a, it was a doubles tournament. So it was a, like a team tournament. Uh, it was supposed to be two versus two and, uh, only one person showed up and that, <laughs> so that didn't end up happening. Uh, part of that I blame was the, was the store didn't do any promotion or put it on their calendar or anything, but then. The next tournament I ran was a Commanders tournament. I don't know if you guys remember Commanders. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I never tried it. I had the model, but I never actually got a chance to play it. Yeah, so I was, like, the first one doing Commanders, like, <laughs> before it had that resurgence. And then that was that was only a four-person tournament. And so that it, was, it kind of felt like it was going a little bit backwards. But then um, the Bay Area Open was uh, 12 people. And then uh, I think the the next tournament I ran, which was the SoCal Open in 2019, I think we had somewhere around 30 people. So it just it definitely grew. Um, and then <laughs> funny story about that tournament: I way over prepared for terrain, uh, and I I had enough terrain uh, basically to run uh, like an, a 40k major. <laughs> And and, uh, and it was for this kill team tournament, and I was like, "Uh oh, this might have been too much." I'm yeah. always always overestimating uh, the how big things will get. I guess <laughs> you know you it's good to be ambitious. Button. Yeah, yeah. I I've definitely found that tag team tournaments can be a little bit harder to set up. I know that you know now we've had. I think on the West Coast, there's the All Valley Team Tournament down in LA that's done pretty well because yeah. Dakota was able to set it up. And locally, we just had a uh, doubles tournament in Brooklyn. We got 32 players, which was really good. But I know for 40K, getting those tag teams, it's, it has been hard because it's like people want to do it and then you'll say it, but then people will try to like 
schedule up and not enough pairs show up and then it's just yeah a lot, it's a lot riskier it feels like than just a kind of a one-off tournament that people are super comfortable like oh this is what i'm gonna do but tag team is like it sounds cool and then people realize like oh i need to find a friend i need to like we need to plan or getting uh maybe in the era before discord getting your pairings was a little bit harder so yeah i mean i tried to be i tried to be smart with that first tournament and i did a lot of the things that dakota is doing now with, with like the free blade system you know like if people show up you can you can kind of like make a team that was like the plan mm -hmm. at least you know the the idea was that anybody who showed up could could theoretically find a yeah. team yeah but uh yeah that that back in the old edition was not very popular but it does seem to be getting more popular now uh the I think it was a uh, Adepticon had that doubles tournament and that sort of got everybody excited. We just recently had one here locally uh, in in Roseville that um, that there was a a few teams that showed up for um, Chris uh, Baki uh, uh, ended up winning um, with Rachel, one of our uh, bats teammates. Very cool. I mean, Jason did pretty well at the Adepticon tournament, if you didn't know. Oh, oh yeah. The uh, Adepticon team tournament, tournament uh, we got first place. Oh, congrats. It was, yeah, that was a really fun event. Nice. Yeah. I know that the team tournaments, that kind of like sparked a bunch of people to talk about team tournaments. Uh, you were talking about the All-Valley team tournament, Dakota's tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, that That's still probably my favorite tournament for kill team i've ever been to uh it's just amazing and i'm looking forward to the the next one this year yeah the next one is coming up pretty soon right it was like in the middle of the year I, rather than i believe it's like it's august or september uh check yeah, okay. out listersworkshop.com if you want to if you want to check it out but i uh i know he's got the date on there i could probably look it up but yeah <laughs> yeah, I thought he pushed it. I, I remember last year was closer to the end of the year. I thought he had pushed it up a little bit more. So, yeah, but I'm not 100% sure about the dates. I just know that um, some people um, like Micromancer or not Micromancer, um, Blaine from Six Sided Legion, his team is playing oh, yeah. the All Valley team tournament. So there's a lot of people excited to head out to L.A. for a fun three. It's triples, right? Yeah, three people yeah. per team. Oh, yeah, it looks like it's September 23rd and 24th. OK, yep, yep, yep. So that one should be good. Teams is definitely a nice. It's an can be slightly more chill, which I think is good. I think uh, for our most recent tournament, I tried to make sure that the pairs would have to interact a little bit more because one of the other tournaments I went to, it felt like we were just two, playing two games next to each other. So we force people, we let people steal CP, let the CP reroll a reroll dice, just so like you can you can like look at your opponent, and you're like okay, this plasma is. Uh, made a lot of ones i just need this one to not kill me <laughs> yeah i know that the like adepticon actually had the two boards like put together and one was open one was into the dark and you could like shoot from one board to the other you know like and your team could actually like move on to the other board and there were rules governing that which i thought was really cool and uh the one here locally roseville was was run that same way but um, the All Valley Team Tournament had a different system that's more akin to like the 40k way of doing a team tournament, and it was it was so amazing to have like basically you have three people on your team and you get to kind of like mix and match like which which matches you're gonna have against your opposing team. Like um, everybody gets to pick like their their top priority, etc. That sort of thing, and. Um, and then the game's kind of like your your uh, team captain kind of figures out what's going to happen. And the cool thing about it is you you get to kind of like have that back and forth with your team strategizing like the matches and the and you know what's what's going to you know oh well my pathfinders are going to go way better into the this intercession team than you know that sort of thing right yeah did you have any um so after that first tournament kind of flopped do what were you feeling like how did you get the next tournament to like run better what was going on for you because i know that must be i know like as a tournament organizer if i was if i tried to set up a tournament and like no one showed up i'd be like man am i like what do i have to do like what what got you through that yeah i mean it was really hard for me when that 
first uh, tournament. This was well, technically the second tournament flopped, but I I attributed that more I think at the time to the store than to like my advertising and 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 work because the store had like not worked with me very well. I I hadn't done them all at the same store, so I was kind of jumping from store to store with all the tournaments. Mm-hmm. And then when I went back to the original store that I'd had success with, I continued to have success there. And I was sort of, I sort of started working with that store more regularly. And I think that kind of let me not think of it as, as my negative, mm-hmm. at, but more of like an outside factor. Like, oh, well, obviously there's not as many kill team players or like this store isn't doing as good of a job promoting the event as this other store, you know, that sort of thing. It worked out that the store that was doing well, my friend was also the manager. So, you know, it, it, it just worked out way better and it was much more fun to do the events there. They had a much better system in place for, for the events and everything. And um, yeah, I mean, as with anything in life, you know, uh, success is uh, just, uh, uh, you know, picking yourself up after a bunch of failures. You know, nothing works the first time. You know, I got pretty lucky with that first event, but, you know, the, I, you know, I didn't expect after that, you know, it to, it to go as, as big as it did, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a common, I think it's, it's like a common thing for like building communities where you do have to put in the work and sometimes it's not always immediately apparent. Like I know locally we've got a couple games that have one person kind of pushing through and, you know, it starts slow and it picks up, but sometimes there's lulls and that always, that happens to all of us. I think like for, Kill Team is a much bigger game now, and at our group, I think the first tournament was maybe like 12 people, and the next one was like 8, and then when we took a break, we finally came back with like 13 or 14, and now, you know, with the most recent team tournament, a year later, we're at like 32 people, so it's it's all about, it's like the perseverance, which is not always the easiest thing, when you're like alone running that first tournament, or running those first couple game nights, right, Jason? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, perseverance definitely is the the one thing that all three of us 100% agree on is like a a key ingredient in building and maintaining a community. Agreed. And keeping like a a positive attitude, like it can't just be persevering and being grumpy because I don't think (laughs) people like people like, you know, if you're grumpy when you're like introducing the game, because I know I did that one time and I definitely turned that person off of the game. I was like, ooh, I messed that one up pretty hard. Can't do that again. So yeah, I guess I guess it benefits me that I'm Canadian, so it's hard for me to get too grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> but a Canadian niceness pushing through, huh? I guess. Yeah, exactly. You've got the, the Minnesota nice. Minnesota nice <laughs> is also a thing. Yeah, yeah, I actually lived in Minnesota for for a year, so I know I know all about it. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Minnesota right now. Nice. That's yeah, I lived in Rochester. Minnesota nice. Rochester. <laughs> So you were a tournament organizer. Now you're more of a player. How is the how is it making that transition from like being really deep in the community organizing to kind of transferring to more of a player role? How's that kind of like play it out? Do you enjoy it more on the on the you know not community organizing side? I mean, I um, it's it was a it was a lot of factors, but the 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 real like impetus for the transition was that I thought you know there were there were better people for those roles like Dakota who you know would be able to turn it into something profitable and successful for himself you know and you know at the same time i i had experienced a lot of just like stress from running everything just by myself right and yeah. you know it was nice to take sort of a breather and uh get back to you know the fun because at the end of the day, I started running all of the events because I enjoyed the game, and I kind of had gotten to a point with like all of my events that I wasn't uh, able to play the game because I was just so busy running all these events, preparing, you know, painting hundreds of containers for tournaments, and you know, like get, you know, it was assembling terrain and painting terrain and 
and uh, making rules packets and, you know, doing all that stuff that was all like secondary to the actual part that I liked, which was playing the game. Right. So being able to uh, have great friends that could take over those events and then being able to focus on just playing the game and having fun was was really nice, uh, refreshing got me back into loving the game again and and now you know we're we're building like you said a community here in the bay area with our bats team and it's been really great uh playing and 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 training for tournaments and some of our players have been like very very successful and uh yeah it's been great to see us go from you know halfway through that season starting our 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 team to them finishing the ITC season fifth place in the world, you know, so that's been really nice. And it's, it's been a different change of pace, which I've really enjoyed with, uh, with our team. And, you know, we're all friends. We talk on discord and we're regularly playing games, uh, you know, every week. And so it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, the, Community is definitely better with you in it. I mean, I'm sure that as an experienced player for the community, like everyone, I'm sure a lot of people on your team are like, oh yeah, Sheldon's, you know, we have Sheldon from, you know, way back in the day, <laughs> still playing stuff. And you you guys are still running tournaments in the Bay Area, right? You have one coming up later this month? Uh, there was one yesterday. Um, and then, yeah, the Bay Area Open is coming uh, in in a couple weeks. Uh, here in... Um, uh, Berlin game we've got on the 27th and 28th of May where we're going to be uh, uh, I'm, I'm running the the Bay Area Open tournament which is actually the the first tournament that Frontline Gaming ever ran so it's kind of got that like long history with Frontline Gaming uh, it's traditionally been a smaller uh, tournament but uh, looks like uh, you know this year it's it's doubled or potentially even tripled in size so that's nice very cool. Yeah, I mean, I think by the time this podcast comes out, it'll be about a week away. So in case anyone in the Bay Area doesn't know, we've got a big Kill Team tournament coming up. And Sheldon, yeah. one of the primary, are you TOing or are you playing this one? I'm TOing this one. So, you know, part of the 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 thing was the Bay Area opens really easy for me to run because it's like 30 minutes from my house. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> It it wasn't a big a big deal like going out to Vegas or in the case of like the Kill Team Open all the way off, off to the East Coast Baltimore you know <laughs> yeah the yeah. Bay Area Open's nice and simple because it's just here in uh, Berlin game which I can get to in a car ride <laughs> yep I mean we're definitely at the New York Open later this year a lot of the reason why it's in New York is because we have a lot of stuff in New York so it's very easy for us to like push everything to one spot. So I definitely know that feeling of like, it's nice to have something in our backyard. Yeah, exactly. And Jason's got plenty of stuff in his backyard too. Jason, are you going to plan to, are you planning to run like a bigger tournament this year? Um, you know, I, I was kind of been thinking a little bit about trying to put together something that would be like an annual thing that would be worth traveling for. And I kind of just have like some little like sketches of that. And, uh, I don't know. I guess if you guys running bigger stuff that people travel for, maybe you've got some advice there. Yeah. I mean, uh, the best thing is to just do it, you know, just, uh, just make the, make the date. And then, you know, I always work better with a deadline. <laughs> that's, that's a bit of advice I, I can give it. Once the deadline is there, you've got the date booked and you've told people about it, then it kind of forces you to, to start advertising and, and doing all the necessary preparations. And, uh, you know, sooner sooner than later, it's happening and you're surprised with, with uh, what you can accomplish. Yeah, I mean, definitely for the, you know, our local tournament scene and the New York Open, it was definitely once we had a line on a venue, it was like, all right, these are the dates. And we'll push it out to as many places as we can, and we're just uh, we'll just see how it goes. Yeah, just gotta go for it. Yeah, it's definitely a leap of faith. I'm sure Sheldon had that same same feeling when he was doing the the first large event, right? Yep, yep. It's always. I mean, I I went a little bit too hard. <laughs> yeah, with the 15 arena boxes. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that 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 um definitely led to to what ended up happening because then everybody wanted uh you know 
the arena kits because uh, at the time they were like the standard competitive kit and i had all like you know all the world supply of them apparently <laughs> yeah and then but, uh, you made a you made a a mission pack a while ago that was basically like into the dark for the 2021 kill team but using arena boards uh yes. knowing the rest of this story it makes a lot of sense why um i'm curious <laughs> if you're still like if that's if you're still like working with that or if you've kind of put that on the back burner uh, i mean i've kind of put uh that on the back burner but i do still have uh you know all those arena sets so uh but you know we've been having a lot of fun with with the official into the dark uh sets we have enough now that you know we can we can play with those and so you know necessity was was more of the reason like uh i started with that was because you know you work with what you got i had a lot of arena sets um it was easy to run run an event with the arena in the, with the end of the dark rolls like i was able to you know run like a, a 20 person uh end of the dark tournament like you know i think it was it was like a, a month after end of the dark had come out you know whereas nobody else could have done that because the uh those kits you know they just didn't have them whereas i was sort of leveraging the fact that i had something similar which was sort of the impetus for using those uh those boards uh because it was easy to scale quickly yeah that yeah. makes a lot of sense working with what you got is definitely really important like i know locally in new york we had a lot of people buying a lot of boxes and everybody wanted to paint them so we were able to source you know, terrain from the community, which helps a lot and keeps things kind of like local. Um, and then, you know, back in the day, I think Arena was also a better game system, better format anyways. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, there maybe was... not as much now. Now I feel like there's, you know, positives and negatives for both open and in the dark. They're just like different. They just feel different. I mean, the same thing happened uh, with Arena back in the old edition. There were some people who preferred open, some people who preferred the arena. Um, uh, my famous block city layout was sort of meant to sort of bridge the gap, have some open uh, uh, terrain that that functions similar to arena, and um, uh, you know that that I think uh, kind of falls into the same thing that that's happening this edition. You know both. Both have their strengths and weaknesses. You know, there's no vantage in a, in in into the dark, and uh, you know, line of sight is is a lot different. And um, some teams perform better or worse in in either format. And um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're it's. I think it's it's fun to have uh, different ways to play. You know, just playing the same map or the same like thing every single time can get boring. Whereas having you know that variety really makes the the game experience more interesting and more fun you know yeah it definitely does do you have any um do you have any teams that or like strategies that you find are better on either side because we have this portion of the podcast we like to call niche tactics where we talk about fun things that we like doing that maybe we don't see other people do or have worked well for you in the past uh well you know um the most success I've had um, with a kill team has probably been my legionary um, that that I played, and I won won a couple events with those. Um, and uh, one thing I did with them that not I didn't see really many of the other people who were playing legionary uh, competitively do was I ran like mono corn. I love and, that so um, much. Yeah, that's, I mean, part of it was I love corn and all my guys are painted as world eaters. So, I mean, it just made sense. But the other thing is, I think that it was like, it's legitimately such a, a great uh, strategy with that team, you know, rather than trying to like hedge your bets with Nurgle, you're you're going into your strengths with corn and, and making your, your uh, melee even more brutal. Are there any, like, particular plays that you try to go for in every game, or is it kind of just, like, entirely reactionary? Uh, well, typically, I will take the Shrive Talon and the, the, um... Butcher? The, uh... Or Anointed? 
Uh, I don't take the anointed very often. Um, oh. Yeah, the 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 main team I usually have is the Shrive Talon, uh, the leader with the plasma. I'll have the um, uh, the two gunners. Usually, one is the plasma, and then the other. I'll take the. Um, it depends on the matchup, but usually the missile launcher. Um, and then I'll have the, uh, uh, like I said, the Shrive Talon, the um, Sorcerer, and the last one's usually sort of a flex pick. Sometimes it's the Anointed, sometimes it's the Butcher. Um, uh, most often it's the uh, um, Icon Bearer. Okay. Uh, the yeah, Icon Bearer. The Psyker, you have to take him as Undivided, I assume? I was actually about to ask if you didn't take the Psyker because you were playing Corn so much. So he, he's modeled as a Corn Psyker. I take him as Zinch because you have to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. All right. That's <laughs> but, That was the secret. I was like, I don't know. Yeah. I thought that you weren't allowed to take the Psyker. So I thought you if, I, if I could bring him as Corn, I would. But, you know, alas, uh, it's not possible. But he's Corn in my heart, you know? <laughs> and for and for listeners who don't know because i don't know if everyone has seen the missile launcher profile it's a it's got a frag profile so four attacks on threes three five blast two and then the crack profile which is much better which is four attacks on threes five seven ap1 so it's a super spooky heavy gunner yeah it's it's a good flex like you can kind of use it into Hordes or elites, pretty good because it's got sort of that back and forth, and and the plasma is just always super good. So I mean that one, yeah, pretty much an auto take. Um, but yeah, one of the things I like to do is I go for, oh, uh, it's the name is escaping me right now, but it's the it's the, uh, it's the it's the tack op. Oh. No, I was gonna say it's the tack op where they uh. You get uh, if you kill. I think it's three guys with one one model. Um, it's like Savage Butcher. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I almost always am doing that with either the Shrive Talon or the Leader. Uh, let me look it up. It's the yeah. Uh, three, yeah. three enemy operatives in combat, which is generally pretty hard without the. I think the extra movement from Corn is how you're getting away with it. Yeah, I mean, I I almost always. Uh, uh max that in every, in every game and uh it's it's usually either with the 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 leader or it's with the um the shrive talent with his ability to, to always fight first because you can you can get him like right up and then anybody who charges him he can just murder <laughs> is he is he normally carrying the grizzly trophy or is it like where does the grizzly trophy end up because that's also a big part of uh really powerful melee list for the legionary team which yeah, is minus one melee, minus one attack in three inches from the target i don't typically take the grizzly trophy um on my team usually i've got um warded armor the suspenser system and uh i'll put tainted rounds sometimes on the um on the uh, icon bearer you don't even do the knives then. Very interesting. Yeah. So that's sort of my standard go to. Yeah, I just like I just I just like uh running them up and getting them into combat and uh always surprising the enemy with, with how many how many guys I can kill so fast. <laughs> yeah, I mean when you can set up so I, how often are you getting perpetual aggression charges with the six corn guys? Um, I I always try, but it's 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 you know it it depends. I we here in the Bay Area with all our our bats players, we're uh we're pretty uh everybody here is really good, so they don't usually let you get easy uh uh things like that. But I have definitely made. Uh, uh perpetual aggression work for me pretty well since it's uh free you know you know there's no reason not to usually take it mm -hmm. yeah so perpetual aggression for listeners since i doubt anyone has really played against all that many core and legionary players allows anyone who finishes a combat 
to then move another three inches into engagement range with someone else. So yeah. it's basically a free movement if someone is within three inches. So you can let it, the corn operatives like one shot someone and then sneak into someone else. It's really strong and into the dark, I think, because you're usually like bunched up in a corridor. That's where I usually get the most success out of it. Especially because, like, the Shrive Talon, for example, can uh, use his, like, gory display or whatever it's called, where he gives someone minus one APL, and then if you then uh, perpetual aggression charge into them, they can't fall back if they're a two APL model, because now they just straight up don't have enough APL to fall back. And then if they fight you, they're they're fighting second. Yes, it's a very strong combo. I love that. Thanks, Sheldon. I was not expecting to hear Corn being the uh, the sneaky. Beast. <laughs> yeah, I was really excited about that. Like you said, Legionaries, and then I was like, "Oh, let it be Corn." Like no one does Corn, and then you said that, and I was very excited. <laughs> yeah, that's my main team. I have uh, all my uh, all my guys painted up as World Eaters, and uh, it comes comes from uh, my 2018 team that was uh, I, I was. Uh, I was constantly running like all berserkers. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Locally, you know, on the niche side, I have a player who's really into Zinch because uh, in mixed formats on In the Dark, having a three APL model that can now open a door while doing all of the rest of his moves has been very good. And he, uh, with also Zinch provides like a very powerful baseline recovery, which with uh, if you get a crit save, you get a. Re- a fail going to a normal and everyone says three up saves are great but i'm sure sheldon you feel felt the missing one dice out of three plenty of times <laughs> yeah. yeah which is like exactly statistically average and like yeah yeah it's gonna but happen. i definitely don't i definitely don't roll statistically average most of my uh teammates it's kind of a meme at this point and the rolling like sheldon means rolling all ones on every single roll <laughs> impressive yeah, we have a player locally that I've known for a year and a half now, and he consistently rolls ones and twos uh, as Void Dancers. So I'll just casually walk by. He'll be throwing attacks for the Death Jester, and he'll just miss four dice. <laughs> yeah. Every other every other shot, I just I just don't understand how this is possible. <laughs> yeah, I I was playing um, against Gellerpox uh, a couple months ago, and I got a roll where I got to re-roll ones. And I hit on threes, and I rolled all twos. Literally every single one was a two. I was like, yep, that sounds about right. <laughs> Couldn't have it any other way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, you know, that's why I had to get so good at the game is because I knew that, you know, I couldn't count on my dice rolls. I had, had to, to win. rely in, on everything going wrong. Right. And, yeah, win on just, like, positioning. <laughs> Um, I've had an interesting experiment lately playing pure in cursors on Into the Dark. Uh, nice. That's been fun. I just like put everyone on engage and then like pop smoke on the doors and then uh, move and double shoot. And like obscuring is the only thing that keeps you safe on some of these Into the Dark missions. So in cursors, ignoring that and then using smoke grenades so that you can't shoot back even if you wanted to. If you like, if you hit someone really hard early, it's just really hard to come back from that, and that's just been a fun, interesting thing. And like, if someone guards in a room, you can just um, set up a non-reciprocal, like, obscured shot to take them out, and just and cursors are really cool. Sounds pretty brutal. Yeah, we have a a, a player locally uh, who who uh, has made us scared of Phobos since before they ever got buffed. So anytime. They buff Phobos. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, I do think that both me and Jason are on the on the Phobos train right now, especially after talking to some other Phobos players. Oh yeah, definitely. I like. I can't help it. Every time I t- paint a Phobos model, I'm like, I'm going all in on this, and it's like, it's definitely the model that speaks to me the most. Where just like I've I have like three Phobos kill teams, and like my 40k army, I have 30 Phobos Marines. It's a lot. Nice. I love them. Yeah, I have I have a Phobos uh, team that uh, I made all Death Watch. Oh, same. That's nice. my Phobos team. Yeah, that's a cool concept. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that we can take it, because there's, you know, there's... I think there's Imperial Fists, Crimson Fists, Sneaky Marines, Raven Guard. There's all sorts of 
crazy cool ways that you can do stealth marines instead of the standard giga chads <laughs> yes so are you excited about the new space marine heroes team then i think it looks think cool yeah i'm we'll see i'll i'll probably be less sure if they actually release a seven marine team that sounds a little spooky because uh six marine teams already feel pretty on the edge of being good sometimes so having a seventh marine if you're playing like a an 11 win 11 model team just seems kind of crazy did they did they say it was a seven model team i thought it i assumed it was just like had a couple options and it was going to be like five i think there was some wording on the yeah i kind of assume it'll be six but i think in the original wording of the article it sounded like there would be seven operatives and some people were wondering if there's gonna be a seven model team i assume it'll be there's seven unique operatives and you still only pick six which is fine but woof, I, to have seven, even if you like didn't have strat ploys or tack outs or something, that would be very spoopy. Especially because there's like, you know, I'm assuming the eliminator is gonna be better than like a regular intercessor, and like there's a captain with a power yeah. fist and a plasma pistol or like whatever. That's what you makes know. me lean towards maybe it being a five model team, but I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Anyway, Sheldon, you've got a big tournament coming up. You want to uh, talk about it a little bit? Yeah, I mean, we touched on it a little bit, but the Bay Area Open, uh, May 27th to 28th, uh, going to be here in um, uh, the San Francisco area, uh, close to the San Francisco airport at the Marriott Waterfront uh, in Burlingame. Should be uh, lots of fun. It's part of the Kublai Khan uh, convention. That uh, happens every year here in the Bay Area. Um, lots of uh, amazing vendors and and uh, and games and and people come out uh, for the for the Kublai Khan convention. And the Frontline Gaming has been running uh, the Bay Area Open as a part of that for I think about ten years now or longer. Um, it was the first tournament that Frontline Gaming ever ran, and it's had Kill Team now for uh, the last uh, three. Uh, uh three tournaments and um yeah it's always it's always been a lot of fun we're going to be doing uh similar to uh LVO with the with the Lusters workshop uh terrain which is really fun um and uh and into the dark so yeah it should be a pretty fun event yeah sounds great two day event it are you guys going to be a silver ticket golden ticket uh, unfortunately, as I said before, this has always kind of traditionally been a small event, uh, so we didn't get a golden ticket this year. Although, if um, as many people show up that have bought tickets, I'm more than uh, confident that they'll give us one next year. You know, because we'll have uh, grown so much. Well, I'm hoping. I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully, yeah. it's a tickets? smash hit. It's... Go ahead, Jason. Uh, yeah. How many yeah, tickets think... have you sold so far? Should be about thirty at this point. Oh, that's awesome! And since you know, I think the biggest BAO so far is twelve people. That's that's pretty good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's a huge increase. So, looking forward to seeing how that goes and to seeing the results. Yeah, and I'm sure some people haven't gotten their tickets yet, so we might even see it grow. We'll see. Uh, you know how many people show up. One thing about working with Frontline Gaming, they don't typically give you the numbers. Uh, and like all the all the details until close to the date, so still kind of an unknown on on how big it it could get. We'll see. I think, uh, but you know, a lot of our uh, local players are super hyped and uh, um, very excited. Uh, we have uh, the local crew, the Bats, the Bay Area Tournament Squad, um, should be coming out in full force. I think almost everyone from our team is going to be there. Makes sense. Makes sense. I mean, you guys are the Bay Area Tournament Squad. You got to defend your turf, right? <laughs> Fair. On the other topic of uh, other things in our podcast space, me and Jason have opened up our own Discord. That's true. Nice. We will have a link to that in the episode description if you are looking to join that. 
if you want to chat about any episode or talk to some of our guests, then we invite all of our guests onto that Discord. So, you know, if you have questions to Sheldon or want some help, you know, all three of us here have been running our local communities or helping out. So I'm sure we can give you some pointers. Heck yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. And we also have a Patreon if you love what we do and you want to show some support. That will be linked in the episode description as well. Thanks again, Sheldon, for dropping by and talking to us about the grand old days of old kilt. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me, having an old dinosaur like me on your show. <laughs> no, 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 you're still you're still in the meta. You've got a team. You're gonna cr- you're gonna help run this big tournament coming up. It's all good. Yeah, just wait until my Inquisition, uh, the Inquisition agents come out, and I'm uh, <laughs> I, I I'm so hyped to walk up to a tournament with like an apocalypse box full of models. <laughs> <laughs> Like, where's your roster shot it's like oh they're here you just start picking up random models and stuff. <laughs> well thank you guys for having me it was a blast yes thanks for coming on hopefully everybody's still listening is uh soon to be a patreon get on that patreon hey